<laughs> oh man, oh sorry. I'll try to mute that when I do it during the Yeah, recording. that sound really flimmy. It's coming up, man. I'm telling you. All right, you ready? I'm ready. <clears throat> Three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Fans in Motion podcast, the only podcast that you didn't know you needed. I'm looking at my friend Josh, and I'm saying to him, and the elusive rock on in their own special way. No better reason to come home. I'm coming home to stay. Say hello, Josh. Yo, 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 everyone out there in Night Ranger land. Welcome to a uh, another big and beautiful uh fans in motion uh episode thank you for joining us thank you thank you thank you that was uh i ripped that lyric from the high road album of a song called i'm coming home and i thought it was slightly appropriate because i will be coming back home to my buckeye state this weekend josh why are you coming to ohio for well, this little group that we all seem to think are one of the greatest rock and roll bands ever in the history of rock and roll are playing Wilmington. And I will be there with my friend Josh. And no. Brentry will be there too. You uh you probably could come to Ohio about every other week and see that. <laughs> 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 Shit, sorry. I'm sorry, but I have a little bit of a, a sinus infection. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you notice, once again, our boy Brent is not here. He was unable to make this little shindig that we're doing, but he will be in Wilmington. We will be in Wilmington. We will be rocking out with our. Uh, yeah, going to Wilmington to see yeah. the greatest band in the world, the Night Ranger, the cream of the crop. Woo! Uh, <laughs> listen here, brother. There's one thing I tell you vitamins, Night Ranger. Um, <laughs> all right. So, uh, um, and with the wrestling thing, I just want to tell everybody, Honky Tonk Man, greatest intercontinental champion in the, you know, um, in the history of uh, professional wrestling. Uh, so as Andrew stated, we three will be at Wilmington Rock the Block Saturday night. So if you are there, um, track us down. Yeah. Uh, should be a good time. Be the... When was the last time the three of us together? Lima? Uh, Dixon. Uh, well, uh, no, Lima. Sorry. All right. I got. What? I don't know which one came first, the Dixon or the Lima. Uh, Dixon was like October. Yeah. So then definitely uh, Lima. Yep. So uh, good time. Going to be had by all. So uh, there we go. So this episode, part two of the John Nyman interview so john nyman the current guitarist for yt been their guitarist for 20 years even though he did play with them some in the 80s uh go back listen to part one a lot of great stories from the bay area and seeing rubicon and the early days of ranger and his you know band the you know which was um oh not mile high but uh 415 uh, 415 area went, code 415 yeah, and then it that, dropped to code and then it dropped yeah. to 415 <laughs> then the eric martin band and uh and then building sammy agar's house and <laughs> greenhouses for all the uh pot smokers and uh it's a interesting uh journey to say the least and part two is just as good so you just uh got done listening to uh part one what did you think andrew yeah i just finished it up i was kind of listening to it in parts and um today was a day off for me so uh i like this guy a lot i really hope i would love to someday sit down and meet him in person he's a he's a good storyteller and he's got some stories um i was loving him talking about the early days uh when he was in that same atmosphere of uh, eric martin and ranger and night ranger and mm -hmm. brad and jack and rubicon and he talks about you know if you haven't seen it you need to go watch it but he just briefly talks about seeing rubicon and how he was really just captured uh captivated by uh, jack and brad he said they really stood out and um and then of course talking about being at sammy's house and yeah. uh 
He's doing yeah. construction. You know, he's doing some side work. He's trying to make ends meet. And uh, he's like Sammy uh, comes up and or no, uh, Gary uh, Peel. Gary Peel comes up and says, what are you doing here? And he's like, ah, I'm just you know, doing some work. And he's like, I'll tell Sammy you're here. And uh, they kind of tell some stories about that. And uh, just yeah. uh, talk about Sammy. Well, uh, where was he at? I don't remember the exact story, but he talks about Sammy coming down. And he just bought one of those Ferraris. Yeah. He's like, I just bought this car for $55,000. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, part two, uh, you know, we kind of <laughs> go into the, you know, the nineties, you know, and we, um, he actually kind of gets out of music for a while. And so the story goes to how he's brought back into the uh, music world and how he came to join one of the greatest American rock bands, Y and T. So uh, if you have not yet, here is his solo record that I rave so much about. I actually had it on the old uh Alexa today playing uh just a good rock album if you're looking for something just good to listen to here it is every song is is killer um you know it's not like it's not like what you would get with YT it's not night ranger it's just i don't know just good old fashioned yeah. <laughs> rock and roll with some good pop you know some songs got you know a little pop to it some are just uh like I said, it's all over the place. Just get it. Trust me. You're going to enjoy it. Um, and Brad Gillis. Yeah. Plays on fly angel fly. So there you go. Yeah. So there's um, a nice um, story behind that song. Uh, they tell us about why that song was, um, yeah, wrote it. Um, yep. I won't give it away, but there's a nice story about that. And, uh, so there you go. There you go. Uh, and he's got it on vinyl, uh, vinyl cassette and CD digital download. Um, if you go to, you know, John Nyman, his, uh, his Facebook page, he also has a Twitter and Instagram, but, um, if you go to his Facebook page, there's the link. I think I put the link maybe in the, you know, in the section, the description below. So just go to that, uh, bands in town or not bands in town, band camp. With it. Band camp. It's I, IAC records, but there's an actual, um, there's an actual app and stuff you can go through and get it to um bandcamp yeah so uh i think it's bandcamp slash john nyman but you you can actually get an app and like if you purchase albums through their like label uh you just basically kind of get it in your own little thing where i think if you buy the cd maybe you get you get that free digital download as well so there you go. Um, sit back, relax, grab a frosty beverage, and listen to part two of John Nyman. Yeah. It's just tonight for us to share. You'll be my lover if you dare. I'll show you things that'll make you feel you can believe this love is real. Anyway, Sammy Hager comes out of the house. At, this is after lunch. Climbs up the ladder, comes onto the roof. I'm up there like pulling nails out of a board or something, you know, just like grunt work. And he goes, "Hey, John, Gary told you you're out here. How cool that you, that you ended up you're working on my house, or you know, whatever." And I go, "Hey, you know, whatever." And so all the guys were like, "I can't believe that Sammy Hager just came out here and talked to you." You know, it's like you're just like, "Who?" I go, "I'm a, I'm a musician. He knows who I am." So it was just a funny side note. I thought yeah, it, it, I, I do. I love those stories. So anyway, back to the flying Joe fly thing. I know we're going to get to that, but mm -hmm. the song that yeah. all these people sang on and played for my friend that passed away. So that concert that I've got said Night Ranger and Y and she played together on this came after that point. This is like 1988 when this happened. This okay. is 86 or whenever I was Sammy was on the roof with me. So I was only at his house that one day working 
you know, and then we got, I sent, was sent to another job and, you know, whatever happened. But here we are a couple of years later, we played this show for Randy. And that, by the way, that money, we raised $30,000 that night. And that's the money that we put out, put that book out with. All that money went to, to finance that whole book. And um, so I'm backstage where the, they all decide the very fit last song of the night should be the song Flying to Fly that I wrote for for, for uh, Randy. And so everybody got together around me and I showed them real quick how it went. And I go, well, I need a, I don't, I need an acoustic guitar. I mean, it, it, I need a, a guitar to play. And so Sammy Hager had one. And they said, hey, Sammy, do you mind if John uses your guitar to play this last song uh, for at the end of the night? And he goes, oh, absolutely. The dude built my house. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was just cracking up because that's how Sammy's that kind of guy. You know, he's always joking and he's always funny and he's always up. You know, he's always mm -hmm. has something to say. But he was very cool. Like, absolutely. This guy, he built my house. He could take my guitar and you know keep it for all I care. <laughs> but anyway, so. I, I went on stage and we played that song as the finishing song and uh, I played Sammy's guitar and there's a picture of me on this trade magazine that came out it says John Nyman sings Fly Angel Fly and I got Sammy's acoustic guitar so it was just a great memory for me that whole night. Um, so yeah. now back to back to the 90s so here I am you're asking me what got me back into playing yeah, guitar. Yeah so what, what so gets I, that spark again? Yeah, so here I am. It's the it's 1996 ish, and I pretty much given up on. I don't play guitar. I just build greenhouses. That's all I was doing in the 90s, and so, uh, I Eric Martin, or Mr. Big is still going, very popular. You know, because I know we didn't talk about Eric Martin joining Mr. Big, but mm. we all know that. And so, he's in Mr. Big. He's really popular in Japan, and they had decided to take a little break, I guess. And he was working on a solo album. And I I heard about it. And then Troy Lucetta, who was in the Eric Martin band, mm -hmm. I guess somehow we had talked and he said, hey, John, I'm going to go, you know, Eric's working on a solo album. He's planning to do a tour. You should you should see if, you know, you, you could play guitar for him. And I go, nah, I don't know. You know, whatever. It's been so long. The years, so many years mm -hmm. have gone by. So I called up his manager. Eric's manager and and he kind of said ah John I'm not sure if you're the right guy your style of guitar playing and blah 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 we need a guy and a guy can do all these different play slide guitar play mandolin and so he kind of brushed me off so I, I thought oh whatever no biggie and then all of a sudden I get a job building a greenhouse in Japan <laughs> I get an offer to go over there and teach their crew mm -hmm. how to do this and so while I'm there I thought well since I'm here I'm at, his album is out. I'm in Japan. I go into the record store over there. There's a big, giant, like full size cutout of it, Eric. You know, you know Eric Martin. You know, new album. And I go, wow, that guy's a rock star over there. You know, and I pick up the CD. I take it back to my room. I have a little Walkman. You know, whatever. Still, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm listening to the CD. And I go, man, this sounds just like my style of guitar playing. The, the style of the music I'm going man this, and so I called Eric up from Japan and told and he's like what do you do in Japan I go I'm building a greenhouse or whatever but I got your record it sounds really great and I'm really enjoying it and then he goes dude do you want to be in my band <laughs> just like that <laughs> and I go I'm like well sure uh he goes you still play guitar right I go oh yeah all the time <laughs> yeah never not at all <laughs> So he goes, when, when do you get home from your trip? I go, well, in another couple of weeks. And then uh, he goes, okay, well, we're going to start rehearsals and we're going to Japan in another month. So I have a one month from the point that he's telling me, I've got to finish this greenhouse job, fly home, learn the songs, rehearse and fly back to Japan with him. And so I'm like, okay, I'm buzzing now. I'm going, this is awesome. I'm going on a full scale tour with Eric Martin and Troy Lucetta, you know, our old, my old drummer mm. from Eric Martin Band and a couple other guys. And I was so jazzed about that. And I said, well, you got to give me at least a week to learn this, the album. I got to get a guitar on my hand. And he goes, okay, yeah, well, you know. 
So I had one week to learn everything, figure out the background vocals. And then Eric's telling me that we have to do Mr. Big songs and all this other stuff I have to learn. I was like, I can't do Paul Gilbert. What are you talking about? I'm not that kind of guy. Well, I had to figure it out real quick. <laughs> so that was the hardest part for me was to figure out some of Paul Gilbert's guitar solos. Oh my God. I mean, I'm just, I'm John Nyman. I mean, I'm okay, but I'm not that guy. But I did it and I got into rehearsals and they go, man, you sound great. You know, I was like, Phew. you know. Yeah. <laughs> So, so that, that's what got me back into playing guitar. And it made me go, never say never, never say never. never. Say never. They don't know what, what's around the corner. And it sure blew me away when I was on stage in Japan and touring with Eric and having just the greatest time. And I thought, what could be possibly followed that? You know, so I stuck with Eric for, we came back off from Japan after three weeks and we still played around for the next couple of years. And then, he went back to Mr. Big and now it's 2001 or 2000, somewhere around there. And he's back with Mr. Big and I'm back to no gig. You know, I mean, I don't, I'm not playing, yeah. but I'm writing my own songs and doing, working on stuff. Just thinking, I don't know what's, you know, someday maybe I'll do a solo album is in my thinking, but I was just, I was just stockpiling songs I was writing. When Mr. Big hit in the late eighties, when you saw that, were you like, well, fuck we could have done that you know like because it's almost like that image came back you know they were you know good looking you know no tattoos you know did that ever just cross your mind like well shit that that's exactly what we were doing and now well, yeah i mean in a sense when i got the uh, with their their second album the one uh with to be with you on it I was driving to a greenhouse job, listening to it, you know, in, on a cassette, I think, in my truck, you know, whatever. And I was going, man, this is good. Wow, Eric, this, I was so blown away with, uh, you know, that set, that album was so fantastic. It's a great album, but um, lean into it. Anyway, so it gets to the very last track to be with you, side two or whatever, last song. And I go, this sounds just like four and five this music, this song, and then it became this hit. I mean, I don't think when I got, it, it, it had, mm -hmm. it had, I got the album right away and I don't think it had become a big song yet, but I was going with, that's the first thing out of my mouth was, that song sounds just like four and five, uh, the songs that Eric wrote with us when we were in four and five with Eric Martin band, you know, it's just the style. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes this huge hit and I'm like, damn it you know it's like <laughs> then i thought that i was like that was what yeah. we were doing and that's yeah, what they liked you know timing you know yeah like, it's, timing yeah it's just like i said that uh um so you know now eric you know your early 2000s eric martin uh tour ends um throughout this whole time are you still you know friends with the y and t guys are they still in your life at all or well, they are in the sense that um, I lived just a few blocks from Phil Kennemore at that time. And I would see him all the time at Safeway shopping and just say, hey, man, how's it going, Phil? And Phil was working, trying to make some money for his family because YNT was completely broken up at that time. And Manichetti had done a couple of solo albums. Mm -hmm. And his wife actually came up to me when I was shopping one day and said that Phil, Philip is he should call him philip philip is so depressed you got to call him up and play some music with him he's just feels so empty because he's yt and you know and i said sure I'll, you know I, he's my buddy i'll you know so i called up phil i said hey you want to come over and, and and jam you know at my house and i have a little i have a you know a little no, a studio whatever out my garage or you know, some equipment set up and he goes yeah that'd be fun and we were both big beetle fans both of us and so we decided we just wanted to learn a bunch of Beatles songs and play them just for fun so we were practicing in my garage now we had the original drummer from mile high dave notary who also sings on flying to fly so on the album when we get to that but uh he is a great drummer and a great singer and so the three of us were doing Beatles songs and singing all the harmonies and my brother bjorn came over and played with us too for a while and we just had this little side project playing Beatles songs. And, and then we moved on to Monkey songs and Dick 
Dave Clark Five songs and uh, you know Paul Revere, you know, Revere and the Raiders. We we're just all the obscure '60s songs that we loved growing up. We would just learn them for fun, you know, and play them. But we never played anywhere. We just played for us. Mm -hmm. So I at that point I said to Phil, I go, you know, because Dave Notary is a great rock drummer, lead singer, great voice, you know, just awesome. And and I I said, man, can you imagine if we got Manichetti in here? We could be the new Y and T, you know, because the band was all they were because Bill and Joey were completely out of the picture, you know, they had disbanded and you know they the other guys had moved on, we're playing with Alice Cooper and Mm -hmm. So there was just Phil and Dave. And I said, he goes, no, that'll never happen. Nobody cares about Y&T. Y&T is over. It's not going to happen. Well, anyway, a few months later, he came to rehearsals and he said that, hey, you're not going to believe it. Y&T is getting back together and we're going to Spain. Some For some reason, we're big in Spain or whatever. And so <laughs> I was like, well, that's cool. So they got Leonard Hayes and um, Joey Alves didn't want to do it, but Steph Burns came back and they went to Spain and they played a few shows and this is like 2002 and then they came back and then Manichetti called me up and said hey you want to be in Y&T and I go yeah (laughs) (laughs) because Jeff Burns is in Huey Lewis in the news and he's got way too many commitments and he's making big dollars playing with them and so he can't do the Y&T gig I mean he went to Spain with us but we're going to keep playing and we got some more dates coming up and you, you got the job if you want it, you know? And I was like, well, heck yeah. So never say never again, you know, here I go. <laughs> and so uh, that was it. That was 2000. It was 2003. And they go better get your passport because we're leaving on tour. We're going on tour with white snake and Gary Moore in England. And uh, in, in, May of 2003 and I was like okay and I remember coming to rehearsal and and Phil said the only thing I want you to do John can you start growing your hair long (laughs) because you got great hair you should have long hair I had short hair at the time right I wasn't a bad Mm -hmm. so I said I'll grow my hair as long as you want to be a YT (laughs) and so here I am I'm still the long hair YT that was all because of Phil Cannibal is it but, still is it still surreal surreal to just like just have a moment and go i'm in y and t yeah i it is at uh, a time because when i think back to those days when i used when i watched dave and leonard in the cafeteria when i was 15 i never even imagined i would end up in their band i mean i just never thought of it but even when i was the background singer dave would tell me because we were we were close friends. He goes, hey, don't be surprised if you don't end up in the band someday. And I, I was a guitar player and I'm like, okay, I'll keep it under my hat. You know, it was that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And it just never panned out at that point because then the band broke up and they got Steph Burns in there because the manager wanted someone that looked like Joey Alves, short guy with dark hair. And then he was also just a fantastic guitar player on top of it. So it's like when he got the job, I totally understood it. I wasn't hurt by it i just went well you know i get it and one of those moments again like "Eh, that's just what happens Mm -hmm. music but then again now i've been in the band for 20 years as a guitar player longer than any other member that's ever been in the band the dave says that to me sometimes he goes what's that feel like you've been in the band longer than leonard and joey and phil i go yeah Um, it's kind of weird you know it's like and then we and him we're kids 16 and 18 and his parents house listening to the scorpions virgin killer album when we're you know going man i wish i could play like Wooly rob you know <laughs> and, and that you know i think of all the years i've had with manichetti you know since a kid teenager and, and to play I, with them now i mean Very it's cool. it's got to be i mean i can't that would be just a dream job to uh, whatever you do guitar bass road crew and just be able to look off to the side and see Dave Manichetti play every night. Like, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I, I tell people, you know, just like, if you've never seen Y and T, you've never seen Dave Manichetti, you got to go. Um, because phenomenal guitar player, phenomenal vocalist. Yeah. And uh, I mean, hell, he might be a better vocalist than he is a guitar player. 
and he's I, a I hell know. of a guitar player. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, you know, and and now I'm younger. Like I was eight years old, 1985. So I had to discover these groups myself. And I always pushed Y&T off because Y&T to me was Summertime Girls. And, oh, yeah. I was, and I was like, ah, that's not my, no. But then, you know, down the road, I get into I Believe in You and, you know, uh, Contagious and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's, this is what Y&T is, uh, Midnight in Tokyo. And um, so you got one of the greatest jobs in the world, man, just be able to look off to your side and see uh, Dave Minichetti every night. Um, and I've seen you guys. Uh, mostly cleveland area you've been the last few years um i think the last time i saw you guys was at tangiers was kind of like a vegas style cabaret yeah. and, and i think dave lost his voice that night. yeah dave lost his voice that night. it's still a great show and you guys pulled someone from the crowd and they sang a song and you sang a couple of songs uh still a uh great show and uh i saw you guys right you guys were the last band i saw right before the pandemic hit uh in cincinnati like late february early march of 2020 um but uh anyone out there that's you know listening from the night ranger world if you haven't seen y and t go track them down when they uh are coming around one of the that's one thing i like night ranger y and t it's just amazing i tell people how lucky we are as night ranger fans that in 2022 number one our band is still doing this right <laughs> but number two they're doing it well yes i mean they may have never sounded better than they sound and that's the same with you guys uh yeah. you know you guys are you, you know musicianship's tight dave sounds great um so i always compare night ranger and yt of two bands that 2022 still sound great and we're lucky to have that um uh so let's talk about uh this right here what about this right here i gotta get that i just saw you got it on vinyls uh everybody Good knows list. i'm a big vinyl guy oh, oh you got the yeah, custom baby. label yeah look at that yeah uh this is all I cared about making when I made my was working on my solo album. I just want I didn't care about CD, the cassette I did. I mean, I did say I want a cassette. I saw the I saw the cassette too on there. Um, the record, record company said, "Why do you want to do that?" I said, "I just want it for me. I mean, I, I'll probably sell one." And they go, "Okay, well, we'll make up a hundred." <laughs> I said, "Okay." Mm -hmm. So they're rare, and so. Yeah, people think I'm nuts that I like, like cassettes, but they sound great, man. I tell you, well, you gotta you get know, cassettes. I, Ringo Starr was on one of the late shows maybe a year ago. And yeah, they're, I saw they're, it. they're talking about, you know, his new record. And he said that the best selling physical copies were his cassettes. They yes. outsold the CDs and they outsold the uh the vinyl. Um, yes, I know. Crazy. And, and it's got a re resurgence. Uh Again, that's another thing is these cassettes and stuff starting to become big. I used to be able to go to thrift shops and buy, you know, component radio, you know, techniques, you know, with all the different components and stuff for next to nothing. And now slowly the price is rising because people yeah. are getting back into that old uh, medium. So, uh, so this record made in America came out last November, if I remember correctly, what, brought me into it from the night ranger world was brad gillis your old partner in crime there from the uh bay area plays a um guitar solo on one of the tracks which we will get to but when i threw this in uh, the uh the old cd player i was i don't know what i was expecting right but uh, what I got was a really damn good record, which you don't get a lot nowadays. You you get some of these records from artists and, you know, there's 
12 tracks and there's four tracks you really like and you go to which nowadays if there's four tracks on there i'm usually happy i'm like all right that's a, you know worth the price of admission yeah. um but this album was just track after track after track i'm like well that's good well that's good and and it's kind of like a roller coaster it's like a different like okay that was that was kind of like i don't even know like big band rock and then the <laughs> next song is like you know is kind of like i don't know just a just a, a bluesy rocker and then you have you know acoustic ballad then you get like bluesy ham and organ and i'm like where am i going? you know I'm, you know which sometimes doesn't work right you get a band and they're kind of all over the place um this one works and when i say all over the place you know it's it's just got this groove so the first song happy it goes back to your tower of power i mean you just get it number one you can't if you're down throw that track in because you will be fucking happy uh it's just got this groove to it you got what it's like trumpets and trombones and a sax and uh just a killer song and um how old is that song where does that song come into play is that something you're writing in the the 90s or something you just wrote recently for the record no um it it came from these other two musicians that I was working with uh, on, on a job. We, I met them doing greenhouses, but we were doing uh, some custom window work on million dollar homes in San Francisco and stuff. It was a, anyway, they were, they had a band and they had a recording studio and we went there after work one day and one of my buddies just picked up a guitar and he started playing this thing on guitar. And I go, what is that? I go, that, I like that. That's cool. What is that? He goes, it's just this little song I'm working on. And I go, what, what do you, is, do, you, do you call it anything? He goes, I just call it happy. <laughs> and I go, can I take that and make us, can I take that home and work on it and write some lyrics to that? Because I really dig that. He goes, yeah, I don't care. I just, you know, it's just a little idea. So I took that home that night and in shit, five minutes, I wrote that song. I mean, I, with his, they, the, him and his brother both played, one was a drummer, one's a guitar player, but there was actually a drummer who plays guitar and writes songs too, and plays bass, whatever, just two, two guys, Salovich, the Salovich brothers. That's why if you look on the, it says Salovich 9 and Salovich, I put their name, say, I sandwiched my name between them, but I put <laughs> it all together and then it compete, then it completely turned around, um, when I very when I first started recording, so this is probably 2000, early 2000s, I guess, when I uh, wrote that song, maybe 2000, I don't know, 99, 2000, I, I can't exactly remember. But um, it wasn't until I went to work with Paul Shortino in Las Vegas, he, you know, who from Rough Cut. Yep. Did he you sing for he a Quiet Riot for a little bit, or? Yeah, he's he's done a quite yeah. sang with yeah. quite a, and lodged up with Carmen a piece on mm -hmm. I don't know, side projects but I met him through YNT came to a YNT show in Las Vegas and we hit it off and I told him I was working on a, starting a solo album he goes you should come to my house I got a recording studio and you know he invited me you know so that was the start of my project was with him so if you look on my thank, special thanks I, I said this is Paul Shortina is really the only guy I thanked on there because he's the one who kick-started yeah. the project I'll, I'll tell him to tell you so I'm in his, we had just recorded Happy, just acoustic guitar and me singing, you know, the click track to, to just test out some of the songs. And we we're having breakfast the next morning. And he says to me, you know what I hear? I hear a horn section on this song. And he started going, -da 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 you know, singing horn sections. And I go, what a great idea. And that's where that came from, Paul Shortino. <laughs> so... If it wasn't for him, I would probably not put horns on it, but it really made that song. It does. Uh, yeah. And uh, 
and what another thing about this record is i mean this the, re- the sound the recording of it is uh because sometimes you get the you know you get records and i don't know it's either thin sounding or there's just something missing and this album like sonically sounds good like there's nothing that i i throughout this i was like oh you know that i wish that sounded a little bit different or had you know more bottom end or anything like that so the album's produced is produced great i mean it's it just I mean, you can get lost in like you got some songs with these ham and organs, and it's just like you don't, you know. I, when's the last time I heard a new, ma- you know, a new record with a ham and organ in it? You know, and I'm like, this is great. Um, and a great and a great player, isn't he great? That that. Well, I know you had Gordon a Moe. Gordon Mo. I know you had a, a few different keyboard players. Uh, because uh, I was looking at one track, uh, um, that you had keys on, uh. I'd have to look, find it again, but it wasn't Gordon Moat was playing them. It was uh, someone else. Uh, but the second song, so it's like, okay, Happy's good. I like that. And then you get the second track, Mate, which I don't know if that would have been like, let's say right after the hair band, right before grunge. Like if that song would have been out then, like I could see that song taken off. Um, but it's got it's got a little bit of soul in it, a little bit of raw. You know, it's hard to really um to get, categorize it, but except that just to say that it's uh good. And another thing I like about your record is I'm a big person on telling people like I'm not a big lyric guy. Yeah, you know lyrics you know when you hear a good song you're not you don't remember the lyrics you remember the melody and stuff but your lyrics are really good in this and i think you wrote um all of those but uh but made tell me a little bit about that because that's probably my favorite track on the record um is that a song you're going to release as a single if you're listening to this number one go buy the record okay number one but number yeah, two, go buy the record. Buy. Yeah, but if you got to go track down a song to get a feel of how great this album is, uh, the title is just made M A D E. <laughs> and yeah, uh, it is. It's just, uh, just a very good song. I, 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 like I said, just uh, different from like Night Ranger and stuff like that, but uh, you know, where it's um, not like the up-tempo rock but this i i kind of categorize some i don't know with this song maybe kind of like an acoustic springsteen you know to where it's more about it's it's mellow lyrically you're kind of following along when did you write that song is that a newer one or an older one it was uh a newer one i was writing songs for well, it's not new now, but in 2010 to, or 20, 2009, I was writing songs for uh, Face Melter mm-hmm. for YT Face Melter album. And so I was just in my garage a lot and working on songs. And so I ne- wasn't necessarily um, think I don't always I don't write specifically for any certain situation. I mean, I can't, I don't do that. I don't know. I, I'm not one of the songwriters who could probably write it, but can you, can you write a song about uh, racing hot rods or, and, and this style? I'd probably, I don't know. It's like, but I just play and sing and whatever comes out. So, but I, I just, I did get some songs on the YNT album you know, on Face Melter from doing that. And then along with that, I was writing some other songs like and made being one of them, just something I was messing around with. And, um, at that time and so i wasn't it's it, it just you know i to me made is along the lines of my beetle influence let's say because it's pop it's more pop rock pop music uh style which is something i you know loved from my beetle days as a kid you know and so the harmonies the style of the singing you know kind of reminds me of the mccartney lennon thing you know mm-hmm. But that's just my take on it. It doesn't sound like the Beatles per se, but um, 
well, if, I would, that... if I was going to have to go with the Beatles sound, that would be where I would go like into uh, Fall in Love. That, okay. that track. Yeah, that's where I like, you know, like that's kind of what I, you know, that, you know, which is another great track. Uh, um, and but that's how that's like even like Give Love Back, which comes after Made. You know, those three songs, it was just like... I know they're, they're completely different. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just that's, like... That's what you do when you do a solo album. You kind of give people to... I wanted people to see what else I do. Mm-hmm. At first, I wanted to hear him let me sing. You know, at first, I was on the fence about whether I wanted to even sing lead on my own record because I wasn't sure my voice was strong enough. I started to be, I started to be a little picky. And, you know, of course, I got Eric Martin right there. I mean, <laughs> my buddy, he would, he, he would totally could, would sing it. And we, we didn't have to call it John Nyman. We could have just called it a band project and they, they gave it a name. The New Poem and Five, you know, I don't know. But, yeah. but I almost did. I mean, I was, and Troy Laqueta, who's my producer and, you know, as the drummer in Eric Martin band and Tesla, he, uh, he said, no, John, your voice is great you you gotta just go with it don't worry about it don't you're overthinking it you know just you, it's your solo album just let it be what it is you don't need to overthink it and so i'm happy with it now but i mean it was a point where i was like am i strong enough a singer <laughs> to do well, it that was what what really surprised me was how good your voice was i'd seen you live you know with yt and you sing a song or two live um and you're a good singer but style. but it's a different yeah. style you know it's a live setting the guitars are turned up um and this you got some you know just acoustic tracks where it's just you know an instrument or two in your voice and i was just really blown away with how uh uh you know good of a voice that you have and then, then you tell me what you just say like i wasn't even sure if i was going to sing and i'm like like how <laughs> what the fuck is this guy talking about uh, <laughs> well uh, because you know how, uh, you're you're your own worst critic you know yeah. that's how most of are so um well troy was right um you know i'm glad that you uh you know did sing on it but like i said when i put the cd in i don't know what i was doing if i was driving or in the house but you know you hear the first track that's pretty good all right you know second track made like damn that's fuck that's pretty good too and then give love back. Now it's like, all right, whatever I'm doing, I, I just remember like stopping. I'm like, I, I probably got to pay like attention to this because this is really good. Um, so, you know, you have like losing, you know, losing track, which, which was the next one was like a kind of bluesy ham and organ. And, uh, you know, like, all right, you know, like that was cool. Like anything with a ham and organ in 2022 i'm all for uh and like i think a lot of people would like pray just like again lyrically um such a you know it's a good song but lyrically i think a lot of that connects with the um a lot of people and again like a song that um you know if this was a different time and you know musical uh um musical atmosphere fall in love is you know poppy catchy and again it's like here i am seven tracks in and i'm still going what the fuck is this because you (laughs) you know you get all right yeah you get you know you got these songs you know i just went through a bluesy you know ham and organ an acoustic you know prey song and the next thing i know i'm getting slapped in the face with this cold catchy pop song um and i'm not even to the brad gillis track yet you know which yeah. is originally <laughs> why i uh i bought this and uh so again uh if you're out there i think that's one thing that a lot of people you know always talk about who are you know fans of 80s 90s 70s music is there's no good music out there you know, they always complain there's nothing new coming out that's good. Well, there is. You just got to look a little bit harder. And I'm telling you, go get this record. It's just, it's a good record. And you will not be disappointed. So let's, we talked a little bit about Fly Angel Fly. So Fly Angel Fly, 
um, was the track that uh, Brad Gillis plays part of the guitar solo. Um, so is this recorded live from uh, that show or is this something? Yeah. You, okay. I didn't, I didn't think it was, but um, it was recorded before. Okay. Let me think about this. No, it was, uh, yeah, it was recorded before that show we did. And so um, the show, the show came out later. It took a while to get that together to um, Warfield Theater. Warfield that, Theater. Warfield. I... The Warfield. That's what it is in San All Francisco. Right. Okay. So it took a while to, you know, schedule that. And, but, but right after the funeral, where it was his funeral was packed with musicians and people in the business that loved him. And I'm singing this song on acoustic guitar. And, and I was in the great Ken band at that time. And you know what, or maybe I wasn't. No, what, what happened was great Ken's manager was there at the funeral, heard me sing the song and he goes, dude, this is a great song. You, we need to do something with the song. And I was like, Oh, okay. You know I mean? I just, it was just meant for him for the funeral. And he, he goes, you need to come over and sing this for Greg, Ken. He needs to hear the song. And so I'm like, okay, well, whatever. So he made an appointment. I came to the studio. He brings Greg Ken in. Now, Greg Ken doesn't even know me. He, I mean, I, Mile High used to play around, but we never played with Greg Ken at the, back in those days. Eddie Money all the time, but not Greg Ken. So Greg, it's funny, he walks in, he's, you know, like, I don't know, chewing gum or something, and he goes, uh, so what are we doing here? You know, he says to his manager, he goes, I want you, I want you to hear this guy, John Nyman, and, you know, I'm holding an acoustic guitar, and I'm kind of embarrassed, you know, it's like, <laughs> and he goes, I want you to hear this John Nyman uh, play the song that he wrote, you know, for Randy Bachman, and he, you know, he knew Randy, and he goes, oh, okay, uh, all right, you know, whatever, you know, kind of like could care less, you know, and I start to play, and he's listening, you know, and I'm playing acoustic and singing it by myself. And, and at the end of the song, he goes, man, you got a good voice. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. It kind of gave you a, a little lift. And he yeah. goes, and he goes, would you, would you want to be in my band? He didn't even say anything about the song. He just said, you got a good voice. And, you know, I can see you play guitar. And I need, you want to be in my band? And he asked me to join his band right then. I said, sure. And so that was kind of a weird thing. Yeah. Anyway, moving on, the manager goes to Fantasy Studios, says, I got this song, song that this guy wrote, and I want to know if you'd give me free studio time. So I want to bring in all these different musicians, Greg Kin being one of them. And uh, and John's got the song, and they go, sure, sure. We know, remember John from 405 and Eric Martin Band. And yeah, sure, we can do that. And, uh, it was a one day event and we, he just, we just put out the word to all the local guys, Eddie Money, Greg Ken, Night Ranger, YNT, whoever can make it to, for Randy to make, we're going to make this song for him and kind of help it to promote his book and that we were, all these ideas that were floating around, putting on the concert and everything. But for now, we're going to record the song. Brad Gillis showed up. I mean, it was just a random hodgepodge of musicians eric martin came mm -hmm. greg mm -hmm. raleigh came uh eddie money was like we got eddie on the phone he says he's gonna make it down but he's still in bed you know kind of thing <laughs> you know? so yeah. all these guys come drifting in and it's like it's one two o'clock in the afternoon already and so i go we got to get this thing going so leonard hayes is on drums phil kenamore on bass of course you know at I, I got them because of ynt mm -hmm. connection and uh, they said they would do it. So I got a rhythm section. So we cut the track, the three of us, you know, me on guitar and, and uh, we cut the basic track. That's how you start. And then we just started bringing in people, Brad Gillis, play a guitar solo, um, Eddie Money. Here's how it goes. I sang, you know, I just sang the verse to him. He goes, okay, I got it. I got it. And it's like first take. All this stuff is like first take. The whole song was recorded in one afternoon, mixed the next day. And that's what it is. And it's, I think it's phenomenal <laughs> that it turned out that good for being so done on the fly, so fast. No second. Brad Gillis and solo, first take. He just, just started playing. I go, man, that's great. He goes, all right, cool. I'm out of here. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it was, everybody was first take. And so, 
and yeah. Leonard Hayes played phenomenal. I mean, for no click track, because Leonard Hayes is, he's not a, he was a wild drummer. You know, he, he was not someone who stayed in time. He, he never played to a click track. Those weren't the days of the click track. I don't know if you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. But, you know, everybody, mm -hmm. everyone plays to a click track these days, drummers. Well, not then. <laughs> and I thought that Leonard did a phenomenal job on drums. If you just sit and listen to what he played and how he kept it in the pocket and let the song breathe. And I, I just, you know, and Phil's bass, everything about that song means so much to me to be in that room and to be producing it, telling everyone what to do. And I, I had a ball. I just had a ball doing that. Did that song show up anywhere before your solo record? No, it sat in the closet and it wasn't slotted to be on my solo record. What happened was I had, uh, Tom, I don't know if you know who Tom Size is, but he was the our live, YNTT's live sound engineer and he also mixed Face Melter. He did everything for us. Mm -hmm. You know, he was our studio. He, a lot, my YNT live at the Mystic. It's all him. He recorded it live and mixed it in a studio. Um, really good but uh he ended up getting cancer and he passed away um i don't know what year it was now it's been five six seven years ago now but he wanted to help me with my solo album and he brought me in he goes john i really want to help you get this record done you got it so close but i want to get in this in my and i go i go dude tom you're sick you got cancer and he's like i don't care i feel good today <laughs> so let's get in here and so we went into the studio. First of all, he listened through all my tracks and he told me, dude, you got a solid album here. There's just one song that's not finished. And I, and I knew it wasn't finished, but I mean, it, I thought maybe I could just slide by with the way it was, you know, and he goes, no, it's not done. You, I, I really don't think this one's ready for the album. So it was, it's uh, slotted to be on my second album <laughs> that's, that I'm working on soon. Uh, and it's called two by two. And so anyway, he go, it kind of reminded him of Tom Petty, but I don't, I don't know if it sounds like that to me, but he said, I don't think that song's ready. So I, I think you got nine songs on your album. I go, I want 10 songs on my album. I'm a 10 song on the album guy. You know, that's the way when I grew up it was 10 songs on an album, five on each side. So I go, you know what? I should just put flying to fly in there because no one's ever going to hear it. I should put it out. And here's the perfect timing to do it. And the only reason that I was a really a little leery about what would happen, which it didn't, it all worked out, is that was recorded on analog tape, because that's what you did in 1988. And now the rest of my album is done digital on a computer, and those two formats don't really jive together. And I was so concerned with the sound differentiating between, you know what I mean, between mm -hmm. cleaner digital format to I don't want to say dirtier, but more rounded, warm tape sound. But it doesn't. The guy who mixed it and the guy who in who he was actually Tom Petty's uh, engineer who uh, for Wildflower he won a, a Grammy. He is the guy. Richard Dodd is the guy that um, what do you call it? Mastered it, and so he knew how to blend the two beautifully and you, do you even notice it i didn't even, i didn't i would never suspected it was recorded yeah you know 30 some years ago yeah um, so <laughs> it completely it, it kind, kind of fits in with the rest of the record which blows I, me away i thought really it was like, i thought this is all new i thought it was you know a newer track or whatever i didn't know this was something you know recorded in uh um 88 88 <laughs> but uh i mean um uh, like i said it's just uh very rarely um in 2022 2021 do you get records that uh you know really impress you and uh, this one so when i got this you know i got it and i was just like all right that's good you know just song after song after song and um and then, you know, there's the Night Ranger connection. Now there's, a, you know, I could do a lot of Night Ranger connections, but, I, you know, I was like, you know, if this album wasn't good, you know, do I go down that path? Uh, maybe not. I don't know. 
but the album was fantastic. So it's like, all right, I'm going, you know, I got, I want to, you know, showcase that. I want to talk a little bit about Brad. And then when we originally talked, you're like, yeah, I saw Rubicon in the seventies. I'm like, holy shit. All right, there we go. Um, one question going back over to the Y and T um, thing before I forget. So the documentary that you guys released a few years ago is fantastic. Um, but they talk about rehearsing in the, I forget what it's called, like the pickle factory or whatever. Well, it was called the shack. The shack. It was, it's it was just a tin, a tin building, like, uh, you know, a corrugated tin metal building, like just for con to a storage facility in the, from the 1970s, you know, 60s, 70s, probably was like a welding shop or something at one time, who knows. But they ended up uh, sectioning it off and they rented out that one room of that building for, you know, probably a hundred bucks or, you know, it was cheap enough. And so they just, that's where they re rehearsed and recorded ever since I met them. In fact, Mile High used to share the studio with them to help pay the rent back in the early yesterday and today days and there we were was, that close to them. and there was like what pickle factory next door so the next whole place door. yeah yeah so it smelled like pickles all the time Constantly, so, you know but... and, and they don't use that anymore correct no the building's still there oh, mean, that's what uh, I, that was where i was going because i saw yeah. the i saw the documentary and they like they mentioned i think that they stopped using it you guys stopped using it but i was wondering yeah. You know, if it's still there, it's like one of those things. It's like, God, if those, you know, walls could talk, you know, like people oh, yeah. probably go by and don't even know the, you know, the history that's there. But uh, so it's still there. Yeah, it's still there. And uh, people have taken, I've taken a picture of it and other people have too have posted on Facebook. Um, it hasn't changed a bit. I think it still has a shotgun blast in the side of it that, you know, there's a story about drive-by shooting and shot, <laughs> someone shot at the building but uh but yeah oh man I have such great memories I was there you know because I like I said I grew up with those guys and I was there from the get-go when they were first playing squeeze and, and I believe in you for the first time in that studio you know when I was I was 19 <laughs> and standing there uh, you know, I worked up the street. I had, that was my first job at a high school. I, I ended up just working a few blocks from there. So at lunchtime, me and the other drummer, the drummer from Mile High, we worked together. We go over there at lunch and hang out and watch them jam. And those are great memories. And they played full blast. I mean, as loud as you can turn a Marshall up to, they played that loud. And Leonard Hayes just, I mean, our ears are just, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, it was such a great time. I can't tell you how, what an influence it was to hang out with the one man yesterday, well, I have to say yesterday and today, because mm -hmm. that's what it was back then. And seeing them write those songs, those early days, and then as it morphed into, you know, Midnight in Tokyo and Mean Streak, I was hanging around with them uh, for a lot of that stuff. And then after In Rock We Trust, when I came in as the background singer, I was there you know, I sang on Down for the Count album, and I was c Contagious, and um, contagious, I, didn't sing on good... I didn't sing on the Contagious album. I was slotted to, but then the producer was a singer, and so he said, we don't, John doesn't need to come down. I can just sing the uh, extra parts, and so, I mean, I wish I, yeah. I wanted to, but <laughs> my name's on the album as a background singer for the tour, or, or touring force, mm -hmm. or whatever, but but yeah, it, it was just a, a great room with a lot of great memories. And I actually, I wrote a song called Never Give Up. And I went down there one night. I used to, you know, I had the keys to the place and there was a little four track recorder down there. And I went down and put down this whole song and, um, you know, a drum machine and keyboard and guitar solo. Stayed up all night. And I remember I brought it home and I, and I, Joey Alves came over my house the next day and I played it for him and he goes, God, that's really good. And I just thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. It didn't end up on this album, but it's one of Eric Martin's favorite songs that I've written. And he goes, I can't believe you didn't put that on your solo album. I said, well, there's just, you know, there's so many songs. I mean, I have so many songs and he goes, dude, that's your best song. 
you left your best song off your solo album. I go, well, it is always number two. <laughs> yeah. How uh -oh. is, uh oh. <laughs> I dropped you. All right, we're back. How is Dave doing? I know Dave's had a few health issues. Uh, is he doing all right? Yeah, he's uh, he's pulling through just fine. I mean, you know, the prostate cancer, they caught it way early. So he's the kind of guy that goes to the doctor a lot and he, you know, takes care of himself and he's always looking out for him. And he knew he had some issues with that, not cancer, but he, his prostate, the doctor said, well, we'll just keep our eye on it. So they were always testing him. And he thought there could be a chance. And sure enough, it was. But they caught, like I said, they caught it way early. So it was easy to remedy. Mm -hmm. And so he's on the mend. And um, he's done. I think he's just about done with his treatments. And then uh, his radiation treatments. They've already done the surgery or whatever mm -hmm. they do. And implant the stuff and radiation pellets or whatever. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, you don't want to know. <laughs> Not a fun thing. But Dave's a trooper, man. That guy... I mean, he's like, he was my best man at my wedding. He's my longest, dearest friend. And that guy is the salt of the earth, the real deal. The guy you want is your best friend. I mean, you know what I mean? He's mm -hmm. like, forget, forget how talented he is. He is, he's got your back. You know, he's one of those kind of guys that's just, uh, I can't say enough about him. What a wonderful human being he is. Well, it's, uh, it's nice when, uh, someone with that much talent is also a, a good person you don't always uh yeah. don't always get that um where can people go to uh purchase this uh john nyman made in america record you got a website or uh is it just the uh yeah. ia records it's on um the record company that is handling iac records has their uh but okay. I'll give you the, the link right now. Well, it's on my Facebook account, but okay. what it is, if you want to write it down or you want to post it, it's my name, John Nyman, all one word, J-O-H-N-N-Y-M-A-N-N. -N. Looks like Johnny Man with two N's at <laughs> the end. <laughs> Dot band camp, B-A-N-D-C-A-M-P, all one word, dot com. And it'll take you right to my link of my album. All right. We'll put and that. You can, buy, you can buy the CD, you can buy the cassette. You can buy the vinyl. It's all right there. You can just scroll down and pick out whatever you want. Um, and so it's johnnyman.bandcamp.com. I will put, uh, so if you're listening to this on YouTube, um, just go down into the um, the description and I'll have links there for you um, to click. Because I, yeah, I downloaded the um, Bandcamp. So that's originally where I think I got your record or yeah um or downloaded it or something. So um but yeah, I see it right there, the vinyl LP, um the compact disc and the cassette. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to uh get the uh because I I don't think there was vinyl when I bought this. Uh no, there was no the vinyl just came out. Uh the vinyl took it took seven months to get manufactured. Look at, look at that! Nelson. Look at that marketing! You you got me twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I was I I was almost like going to say, can we just wait till we can release it all at once? And they're like, no, 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 no. We can get CDs and cassette in like a week. But the other the vinyl takes that long because it's so backlogged. Vinyl is so popular <laughs> again. Yeah that they don't have enough facilities to print them up. And here's another thing, because you were mentioning how you like the sound of my record or my, you know, the, mm -hmm. the production. And the reason I went with this Richard Dodd, who is Tom Petty's guy, you know, Grammy winning. He's, it, these are Nashville guys. They know what they're doing. They, it costs a little bit more. I spent the money to have, it cost me, you know, personally yeah. on my own pocket. Cause I said, I want, and Troy Lakeda too says you do not want to drop the ball when it comes to mixing your record. That's where it's going to, you, you're either going to sound like just every other Joe Blow throwing out a solo album with pennies, or you could spend thousands of dollars and have a super quality product. And I say, well, I want, I want the quality product. 
So the reason my vinyl took so long is I decided to go with the best manufacturing, vinyl manufacturing company out there after researching it, that they do a really good job. And so my vinyl, because I'm a, I've gotten some vinyl of later releases and they sound terrible. They have no, there's no volume to it. There's no tone. It's, it's just flat sounding because it's not, it wasn't designed to be, um, it wasn't mastered for vinyl. Mm -hmm. It cost you, you uh, so my album was mastered twice. It was mastered for CD and cassette, which is the same wavelength, we'll call it, but it's a different way. You have to remaster it, spend a, the, another, you know, thousand, I don't know what it is, thousand bucks, maybe 1500 mm -hmm. to have it remastered just for vinyl. So they can get the right volume and the right bass. And so this thing sounds, you'll be, if you're a vinyl guy, you're going to be real happy with the sound of this vinyl because I am. Yeah. And the other thing my record company wanted me to do, they go, you know, everybody's going with colored vinyl. But my guy that cut the lacquer on this, he says, black is the best sounding. That's why vinyl has always been black. I don't know why it's something in the process of making the black vinyl but it sounds better it might not be a huge difference but mm. you know that's so if people go man i've already heard it why didn't you go with colored vinyl everyone does colored vinyl i go i will on the second record because mm. all it's all all you know but for me this is this was all about me yeah <laughs> this is what i wanted i wanted black classic old style vinyl you know so my I'll go into colored vinyl and make it <laughs> a little more fancy for those people. So Next when do, when do we get the second record? Well, I've got all the songs written for it. And um, there's some really good ones. I mean, I'm really excited because I have a lot of, I've been writing songs for a long time and I've been backlogged a lot of these songs. And I've got another 10 really good songs ready to go. And it'll be in the same vein of this one. I'm going to just say I'm not going off in a completely different style of music. It'll probably be similar in lyrically and, um, and uh, style of music. I mean, it's my song, right? It's the mm -hmm. way I write, you know, mm -hmm. so it'll be similar and I'm probably going to use the same. Well, I don't know. I, I want to use that same keyboard player, Gordon Moat, because I think he's just, yeah. to me, that's the best sounding uh, keyboard that, that B3. Oh my God. So good. <laughs> And oh. the Wurlitzer, if you notice, if you know what a Wurlitzer electric piano is, it's very popular sound. Like the Rod Stewart and the Face has used it mm -hmm. on all their tracks. He plays that on that song, um, Losing Track, that piano solo, electric piano solo, mm -hmm. just before the B3 comes in um, at the end of the song. That's that's my favorite part of the record. <laughs> that. Well, like oh. I said, it was just, uh, you know, just song after song after song. And then like losing track, which, you know, takes another turn, but it's like, yeah. all right, wow, well, shit, I get some, I get some ham and organ, I get a little bit of, you know, like some blues a little bit, kind of, you know, uh, you know, so like I said, it was like a roller coaster, man, I was just, I was just amazed to just where it was going, um, and uh, yep. I just, I highly recommend it, order the record, you know, there's, so let me I just want to bring something up yeah. just because my, the cover. Yeah. 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 There's, there's, uh, there's so much, there's a lot of detail in this cover and I wanted to, you know, my whole thing, even with the music, with the B3 and everything was a throwback to my growing up years, the seventies, you know, the music that I grew up with, you know, Elton John and when B3 ruled, the, you know, deep purple, you know, B3 was ruling the world back then, you know, yeah. <laughs> every John Lord. So I, I really wanted, you know, horn section. I really wanted string section. I wanted to give it that kind of quality of the 70s. You know, real strings, real horns, not simulated, you know. So it cost me the money. I, I did put out my own bucks <laughs> to make this thing. but And this painting, to, high, to the artist that did this, I found this painting at an art show. And I thought that would make the coolest covers reminded me of the seventies, like when the moody blues and, you know, mm -hmm. they put out stuff that you could sit there and stare at the cover while you listen to the music, you know? And so I had this, the artist 
I, I took some doing, but thanks to YNT, he was a YNT fan because at first he said, no, I don't want to let you use my, my painting. <laughs> but he goes, he loves YNT. So he said, okay. And I said, I also want you to put all my song titles yep. on the street signs. And he was like, no, okay, you gotta be kidding. You want me to alter my painting? I said, well, yeah, I mean, come on, you know, I'll pay for it. And he goes, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, he, with some arm twisting, he agreed to do it. So I have, uh, it, with, throughout the whole painting, if you, even on the newspaper, on the, that's on the counter next to the TV, there's two song titles on there, Losing Track and Give Love Back. Um, there's the Happy uh, Liquor Cigarette Store. There's the Truth Church with See You in Heaven on the, the uh, marquee, Paradise Hotel, the Fall in Love Strip Club. Um, and then over this whole crazy scene of like the San Francisco Tenderloin District, you got this pray sign because you re we really need to pray for this situation <laughs> in this baby because it's a bad, it's there's so much going on. But my whole take on this is like looking in, listening to the songs and looking at a mirror, looking into a mirror of your life of, of, drug addiction, TV, television addiction, sex, sexual addiction. I mean, all the things that we go through in life, you know, not all of us, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I surely did, you know, I went through a gambit of, of this stuff and, uh, and, and happy to be completely sober these days, but, <laughs> but it was kind of like a mirror looking at, at, you know, my history. So these songs that I wrote, talking about being happy now and and how like how good your life can be you know when you live a, a live a life of love from heaven above i mean shit, heck yeah you know give love back you know learning to you know forget about yourself and be more conscious of other people uh made was like the song that you like a lot was it started to tell you the truth it's, it took a wild turn it was basically written about lesbians it, it, it's kind of strange but i i just my mind my lyrics just go off wherever they're mm -hmm. going and i just thought the whole side the whole thing of um here we are just me and you let's spend our time on something new why don't you come on over to the other side so it's kind of like an introduction to like a female asking another female you want to try the other side and then in that twisted thought which i'm like I don't know why I'm writing about that, but I go, well, that's probably something that really happens in life. You know, it's yeah. a real situation. Somebody tries that. So as I'm, you know, rec rec re singing this song in the studio when we're working the song up with Troy Laqueta, who's a Christian friend of mine. At the end of the song, I just am singing these words and I go at the very end and I go, because Jesus saves and he's like, I really like that. And I go, yeah, I don't know why I say that. And then the next day, I hadn't written the lyrics for the song yet. You know, I'm just make, I make up lyrics as I'm writing a song. You know, I'm just, I, I make up sound, I, whatever it takes to get mm -hmm. through the song and get the arrangement. Yep. And then, but I had this idea for the song that I'm telling you. So I took a hike the next day, I, which I usually do to open in the morning and get my mind going and think about lyrics and when I'm away from everything in life, just out in the, the trails. And all of a sudden these lyrics came to me that I thought, well, no, how about if it's not about lesbians? How about if it's like Jesus, about Jesus? How about Jesus Christ inviting you to come on over to the other side and see what it's like from the Christian side of things, you know? So I turned the whole thing around and made it about becoming made you know, when you're in the, well, they used to be with the police force in New York, but you became made, you became an officer, but then the, the, the mafia picked up on that too. And you became made into the family. So I was making it, you're made into the family of Christ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now it's, that was my, I turned, turn, so I, the whole song is going along and it just sounds like a love song about saying, Hey, you want to get together? Come on over to the other side. And then, you know, I, I teach you about love. I'll show you what love's all about, blah, 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 blah. And then by the end of the song, it, it's just, that's the point of the whole song. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's well, about coming on over. So 
I just thought I'd explain some of that. And so all this ties in with life and the craziness of life. And there's a good side, there's the bad side, there's the drug addiction, there's the losing track, there's the fall in love, chasing after crazy girls that we've all done all our lives and then it leads you nowhere. <laughs> and then hopefully end up marrying a good one, which I did, thank God. <laughs> but it's just kind of like a mirror of what life is, all this crazy stuff that goes on that you could be wrapped up in, involved in, and television, and credit cards, and cocaine, and marijuana, and cigarettes, and alcohol. It's basically a record out. Al- it's a album cover of all the good stuff. Yeah. Uh, and you know that 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 album cover is made for vinyl. It's sh- it yes. shouldn't be on, it shouldn't be on a small little CD. Uh, no, and that's why I told the record company, I go, you know, I can't change the cover. We have to keep it. You know. I was like, I just wanted to come out on vinyl so people can enjoy the artwork for what it is. Yep. And they go, well, it's going to take seven months. We're going to release the CD now. I said, all right. So I just kept telling people, well, you just got to buy the vinyl because you can't enjoy this cover yep. unless you, you, know, you can get a magnifying glass out, but it's so much easier I mean, when it's 12 inches. Yeah, I mean, I could inches. still see the, uh, you know, some of the, you know, the song titles and stuff like that, but um, you just can't appreciate it until just like a lot of artwork on vinyl. I mean, that's, that's part of the appeal of vinyl is not just the yeah. music, but the, the artwork that, uh, that goes with it. Um, so, uh, yeah. I'm, and, yeah. and you can see the lyrics and you can actually really read them when they're that big <laughs> versus on the CD where you mm. got to get a magnifying glass out. So, and, the, mean, like yeah, said, still- <laughs> and the lyrics are, like I said, I was really impressed with the lyrics, which, if I'm saying that, that actually means something because a lot of times well, I don't, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, um, I, you know, I'm not a big lyric guy. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I, you know, that's if anybody, you know, people that listen to me, I'm always a guy that dismisses lyrics like Springsteen's like to me that, you know, like I listen to him for the lyrics, but really that's it. And but like I said, your your album you know, initially when I first heard it, I was just amazed just how good the, you know, damn, these are catchy. These are good tracks. And then later came the lyrics, you know, after I had the songs in my head, I'm like, well, shit, that's, yeah. you know, it kind of made me think for a second, which, you know, I'm not, I'm usually totally against thinking, you know, and self-reflection, but, uh, but uh, John, thank you for joining us. Um, if you guys are listening make sure you track down this record. I'll have the links for you to click uh, to go purchase and listen to. If you're, if you see Y and T coming to your town, go see them, say hi to John. You will not be disappointed. Y and T along with night Ranger, are probably the two best sounding uh, classic rock bands that are out there. Um, and uh, hopefully on your second solo album, we will get that lesbian song, um, you know, so. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's a popular thing these days, right? <laughs> well, I, hey, nothing against lesbians. I like some of the same things they do. Um, well, and, and so what's the, and the, and the latest thing in the news, of course, my, my wife is so livid about is the re- reversing the Roe versus Wade uh, thing. You know, uh, that court thing. Oh, my God. All, all I hear about at home, and I'm like, honey, I'm just over here. I don't have anything to do with it. They go, no, you're a guy. <laughs> it's, yeah. like it's, it's all the guy's fault. They go, you know what? I'm sorry. So I need to write a song. <laughs> well, they, 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 they say if uh, there were laws where men had to get vasectomies, before, <laughs> uh, that there would be abortion clinics and gas stations. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh but uh, yeah, and if I ever start a uh, podcast on greenhouses, I know uh, who to track yeah. down as uh, uh, as well. But uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, definitely, when I see YNT coming around, I want to track you down, and I'm going to order my vinyl tonight. But uh, John, thank you, my friend. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm so glad that you enjoyed my album. It means uh, a lot to me because. I've- you never know what people are going to think. And I'm just happy. I've been getting a lot of good responses from a lot of different people. Y&T fans too, would, mm-hmm. that appreciate it. Because it's completely different music, you know? And that's always a, a, a scary thing when you go off in a different uh, 
territory. <laughs> well, that that is true, but uh, I think the big thing is you, uh, you know, you followed. Uh, I guess as cheesy as sound, you followed, you know, your heart and did what you wanted to do. And yeah. sometimes that doesn't always pay off. I mean, maybe emotionally you can sleep at night, but it may not, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but in this case, it turned out to be a good record and I, uh, not blowing sunshine up your ass. It truly is a good record. And, uh, thank you for joining us. Love isn't all that they say We can't keep up with all the games that girls wanna play there Welcome back. How was that? Part two of the interview with John Nyman from YNT. I told you it was going to be good. Did I lie? I did not. <laughs> the only time I would ever lie to you is if we were in a relationship, but we are not. So therefore, I will always tell you <laughs> the truth. So there you go. Go find John's solo record. Great album. He's working on album number two. Well, I don't know what we're going to do next week. What's next week? Oh, we will probably be talking a lot about the uh, Wilmington, Wilmington show and how Andy drank for the first time and um, his second time getting arrested. And, Bottoms um, up. You know, so. Uh, well, hopefully, uh, if there's anybody there, they they uh, they give us a shout out. They look for us and try to find us um, mm -hmm. and say hi. We'll mm -hmm. try to get a picture somewhere with all the uh, the maniacs. The fans of Mason, yeah, there's going to be a lot of husbands chasing you down saying, Hey, my wife, all she does is listen to fans of motion and they watch it, it for press watch charges it for you and, you know, wanting to beat you up and stuff. And there is a burning question, Josh. I know everyone's wanting to know. So I'll ask it. What's with the throwback Tampa Bay hat? Yeah, and I like it. Just what's with it. You're, you're breaking, you're breaking the schedule here. You're usually got mm -hmm. the, uh, the Detroit every, hat on every now and then you just need to shuffle some things up. Keep people guessing. Um, uh, I've always liked, I always like football helmets, right? You know, just like yeah. the designs and stuff and the history of them. So, you know, if you go like upstairs, I got a, some of the classic helmets, you know, just on like a little shelf. So I got like, the old Tampa Bay helmet. Yeah. The old green New York Jets helmet, even though they've kind of come back to that now. But the old still, school one. But it's still a little bit different. Um, and I got the old Denver Broncos helmet. And uh, oh shit, I think there's. You got an Oilers helmet? That would be awesome. I do not. I do have an Oilers hat. Uh, but uh, but I like the, you know, the Oilers. But anyways, when I was a kid, I always kind of liked the Tampa Bay helmet. And I always told people it'd be cool if it was like silver and like, you know, maybe orange and stuff, which they eventually kind of did some of that yeah. more like gold and orange. Um, but uh, I always liked, you know, the the old Buccaneer up there and, uh, and they were so bad in the 80s. They were you know, uh, they were horrendous. And uh, so I always rooted for them. And so, yeah, I just always liked that old. The old uh, design. I like the old Patriots. You yeah. know, the uh, guy hiking the football and stuff. So, well, the real question is do you like the old Bengals helmet? The old Bengals helmet. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, like how they came to that was like people would design something like, can you make it uglier? You know, can, can you, you take make... the Browns helmet and make it slightly worse? You know, like Done. it <laughs> probably had like a tiger on it or something. They're like, not ugly enough. You know, it's like, I just want to know, like, like, all right, we're, we're going to call the team the Bengals. Let's, what kind of design are we going to do? They're how, like tigers, right? How about we just put in capital letters, Bengals, and maybe kind of arch it a tad. You're onto See? something. Dude, You're dude. onto something. All right. You, yep. That's, that's going to be, uh, that what's crazy is, what's crazy is 
when they were coming into the league in 1968, there was a tiger stripe design. Yeah. Back then. Now they yeah. had, they had like a B that was horrible. They had some other designs, but and the tiger stripe wasn't quite like how it looks now, but it was there. You could have, and yeah, you could tell it was a tiger stripe. And that's no, sir. That's what they went with. So, uh, yeah. So there you, uh, I love them. There you go. And if I remember I, correctly, until like maybe the Jaguars or the Panthers in the 90s, they were the quickest expansion team to ever make the playoffs. I think yeah. they came in the league in 68, and I think they were in the playoffs in 1970. There you go. Uh, everything you need to know about John Hot. Ryman, a YT, Night Ranger, and the defending AFC champions, Cincinnati Bengals. Um, all right. So, uh, there you go. So go find us. That's not the card. Uh, here we go. We're on yes. some of these uh, YouTubes and the Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. Find fans in motion there. Click subscribe and follow and likes and all that stuff. And I'm slowly catching up on the website, which means getting the audio yeah. uh, up to Pandora's and Spotify's and whatever the hell else is out there. So you can listen to it if you don't want to see our smiling faces so i don't know why you wouldn't there you go john nyman go check out his record go like all his pages twitters and uh facebooks and stuff next week we'll be talking about night ranger in wilmington andrew we're gonna have four beers one shot me and you man that's all for you buddy no, 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 no. I stopped drinking. All right. There we go. <laughs> we will see you next week. Later. Across the dead in the bed of my heart was black. You got to give love back. But to the right one. Who deserve more. All right, now let's do the the <laughs> outro. You want me to do it or you want to do it? Uh, you go ahead. I'm from I'm, I'm going to do a coughing fit here in a second. Coughing fit. I'm telling you, man. All right. I can't get enough NyQuil in me and cough drops and coffee and tea. and Anyway. Hit it. Um, all right, here we go.